But first, have we found the answer to life, the universe, and everything? into what 
what would become galaxies. And within those galaxies, suns were born. About four and a half billion years ago, a rather amiable blob of iron, silicon, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen that would one day be called Earth by its inhabitants began to form from the interstellar dust in orbit around a small star. For countless millennia, that star bathed the little planet in just enough light and just enough warmth to trigger an extraordinary, possibly unique, chemical miracle. A chemical miracle called life. Over time, the planet bore witness to yet another possibly unique chemical miracle. Some of the creatures that were evolving here were beginning to think, and then to question. What was it all about? What was going on? Amongst the diversity and variety which surrounded them, nothing seemed permanent. Everything was constantly changing. And yet, if there were any Neanderthal scientists, they would also have noticed that there are patterns in the way nature operates, that there are cycles which could be exploited for their survival, cycles in which the sun, moon, and stars seem to play a crucial role. And like the scientists who would one day follow, Neanderthal professors may well have wondered whether there are some underlying principles or fundamental laws governing the way the universe works. Not surprisingly, after so many dawns and sunsets, one of the conclusions mankind soon came to was that the Earth was obviously at the center of the celestial web, at the center of the universe, and that the sun, moon, and stars were almost certainly orbiting God. And why not? Given the unremitting evidence of the data available to them, this wasn't such a stupid interpretation of the way the heavens worked. Well, the idea that the sun might actually go around the earth rather than the earth going around the sun is not at all stupid. In fact, the theoretical predictions uh, around the time when Copernicus was working on his new theory uh, of that old model fit the observations actually pretty well. And Copernicus's model, where he put the sun at the center of the solar system and all the planets moving in circular orbits around it, when he tried to calculate where the positions of the planets ought to be on the sky, he actually got a hopeless fit with the observations. It was only when Kepler came along in the next century and decided that the orbits of the planets had to be elliptical and not circular that uh, we actually got a, a model or a theory that fit the observation. At the time, Copernicus and Kepler's idea that the Sun might be at the center of the solar system with the planets in orbit around it was a serious challenge to many deeply held religious assumptions about the universe and man's place in it. In 1604, an Italian mathematician called Galileo devised a proof for the idea, and a few years later was able to check his calculations using a new invention called a telescope. He was arrested and found guilty of heresy. The debate raged throughout the early 17th century, but in 1642, the year that Galileo died, a young Englishman called Isaac Newton was born. Up to the time of Newton, the way in which science been pursued was very different from the way in which we think of science today. In some sense, Newton can be thought of as the first experimental scientist. He realized that by observing the way things were in different places, even in different regions of the universe, you might understand some universal principles which all objects obey. The most notable of these, of course, is that he discovered the way in which the force of gravity acts, and he realized that the same force that is responsible for the way objects fall to Earth is also the force that holds the planets in motion around the Sun. And this was a huge advance in the way we think about the world. 
Newton's mathematical model of the universe was not only astoundingly elegant, but it was powerfully predictive too. It was literally a clockwork universe, and with it he had a means of calculating the positions of the planets far into the future. Newton had found what all theoreticians seek, an underlying principle which unifies a variety of different natural phenomena. It's a quest which has haunted all of the giants of science since Newton. Well, one of the truly great examples of the way the two apparently different phenomena in the physical world are in fact different aspects of the same more fundamental way of thinking was the unification of electricity and magnetism that took place essentially in the time of Faraday and then Maxwell. And what Faraday did was truly astonishing. Faraday was the ultimate experimentalist. He did the most amazing experiments involving the motion of magnets near electric wires and he discovered the principle of the electric motor and the principle of the generator. And it was in the course of these discoveries that he realized that electricity and magnetism, which appear to be very different kinds of forces, are in fact different aspects of the same underlying principle. And this culminated eventually in the work of Maxwell, who understood that you could express the results of Faraday, the experimental results of Faraday, in a very concise mathematical form. This extended, if you like, the forces that were understood from the force of gravity, which had been understood by Newton, to include the electric and magnetic force. As the 19th century drew to a close, the new insights into the laws of physics, which men like Faraday and Maxwell were achieving, seemed to be reflected in the ever more inventive technologies of the Industrial Revolution. Together, it seemed science and technology could answer any question, solve any problem. And in 1880, the chief of the Prussian Patent Office even declared that everything that ever would be invented had been invented. The thought found an echo in America when the noted physicist Albert Michelson wrote, the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. But even as Michelson was penning those immortal words amid the exuberant celebrations that attended the dawn of the 20th century, a fatal arrow was being aimed at the very heart of classical Newtonian physics. A number of theorists were beginning to notice that Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism and Newton's laws of motion just didn't seem to fit together. A German mathematician called Albert Einstein was about to enter the picture with a radical solution to the problem. Einstein had an idea which was to overturn two centuries of conventional thinking. Well, physics was in a real crisis uh, around about the turn of the century. There had been these amazing developments in the form of Maxwell's equations, which ex explain the electromagnetic force. But it then became apparent that this explanation seemed to be in conflict with Newton's laws of motion. These were sacrosanct laws which had been around for a couple of hundred years. And it seemed that if you tried to describe the motion of charged particles, then there was a conflict between Maxwell's equations on the one hand and Newton's laws on the other. Now, many people felt that in that case, there must be something wrong with Maxwell's equations, since Newton was so sacred. And in a sense, it was part of Einstein's genius to realize that, in fact, it was Newton's equations which needed to be modified. Newton's view of space and time is what I think you would say was most normal people's view of space and time. We're all conscious of living in space, which is three-dimensional. You have to go three directions to specify where you are. And we're all conscious of the march of time. What Einstein was to really overthrow that picture entirely. He said, no, you can't think of reality like that. It's not that really we live in a space and then things change in a universal time, which was Newton's idea, but rather space and time are locked together in some way. Excuse me, sir. Do you happen to know what time Oxford stops at this train? Extremely doubtful whether Albert Einstein ever uttered those oft quotes.
quoted words, although if he had, it would certainly not have been a simple slip of the tongue. He believed that it was just as logical to ask what time Oxford would stop at the train as it was to ask what time the train would stop at Oxford. He suggested that you couldn't tell whether it was the train that was remaining stationary while the track moved underneath it, or whether it was the track that was stationary while the train moved along it. It was all, as we might now say, relative. And indeed, the concepts that Einstein produced came to be known as relativity theory. Now, relativity theory has a number of very curious consequences. For example, the speed of light turns out to be constant whenever and wherever you measure it, and yet both space and time are not. Energy and matter turn out to be closely related to each other too. Einstein also completely vindicated Maxwell's earlier ideas, showing that Newton, while not exactly wrong, was only approximately right. There are, said Einstein, tiny but significant errors in the classical Newtonian way of thinking about space and time. Einstein's theory agrees with Newton's theory uh, quantitatively uh, under almost all circumstances. The deviations are really rather small and uh, difficult to achieve. And so you might think, well, what's the big deal? You know, why is it such a revolutionary thing? Uh, the, the two theories agree uh, for, for most of the time. And the answer is that Einstein had really swept away the entire conceptual scheme uh, that Newton had. Prior to Einstein, space and time were really just parts of philosophy. They weren't part of physics. Uh, they were there as a backdrop. Uh, but after Einstein, space and time became part of physics, and it then became important to understand how they change and move and how the affairs of space and time uh, interweave with the affairs of matter. But as scientists and philosophers alike grappled with the apparently trivial but actually profound observation that time and space are somehow woven into the fabric of the universe, Einstein was wondering whether there wasn't some other deeper truth staring him in the face. How was it that space and time were members of the cast rather than simply the stage on which the drama was being played out? And how are the stars and galaxies that populate the heavens affected by such new ideas? The unexpected answer was that all matter causes dents in the fabric of space-time. The larger the object, the larger the dent. It was a geometrical theory of gravity which worked. Time and again its predictions were borne out by observation and experiment. It was a theory which predicted black holes and galactic clusters, a theory of gravitation that was as elegant as it was powerful. It was a picture of the universe that wove matter and time and space and energy irreversibly together in a tapestry of theory that came to be known as general relativity. General relativity is a beautiful theory that has been well tested and explains many features of cosmology, the motions of galaxies, the expansion of the universe, and other phenomena. However, it has nothing to say about microscopic physics at the atomic or subatomic level. Now, it's intriguing that Einstein developed general relativity at about the same time that other people were beginning to understand the laws that govern the behavior of matter at these most microscopic and eventually this gave birth to the idea of quantum theory. The word quantum means a parcel or packet, and quantum theory is a description of nature based on tiny packets of matter and energy. Light can be described in these terms. The packets are called photons, which stream out of any radiant objects, like a light bulb. But there is a problem with light. It can also be described quite persuasively in terms of waves of energy radiating from the source, like ripples on a pond. So what is light made of? Waves or particles? Time for an experiment. The experiment was devised by Albert Michelson the one who 20 years previously had said that there was nothing left to discover in science. Quite simply, it splits a beam of light, in this case a laser, into two, 
and sends one beam to the left and the other beam to the right. A little further on, the beams are brought together again and the result is photographed. According to the wave theory of light, the two beams will create a pattern of bright and dark patches, what are called interference patterns, where the peaks and troughs of the light waves either add up or cancel each other out. In the Michelson experiment, this is exactly what happens, and the camera placed at the end of the laser path does indeed see interference bands of light and dark. But there's a profound philosophical sting in the tale of the Michelson interferometer experiment, as Professor Chris Isham explains. The basic idea is very simple. You have a light source, which you split off into two beams, and then recombine so they interfere. And that's a perfectly normal demonstration, actually, of the wave nature of light. Indeed, it was precisely through that sort of experiment that the notion that light was a wave first came into place. Now, the interesting thing, however, occurs when you turn down the amplitude of the light, make it weaker and weaker. Now, according to classical physics, all that should happen is that the image will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But in fact, what happens, if you look at it carefully, is you'll see it doesn't just get dimmer, it breaks up into dots. And those dots, each one of those dots, is in fact the effect of a single photon. So what you begin to see is how this apparent interference pattern is made up of individual photons. Um, in terms of quantum mechanics, uh, one says, well, why that's happening is that what is really going through this uh, equipment is not so much a light wave, which would be the classical view, but a probability wave, if you wish. And what is happening if the probability waves are interfering? And this, of course, is a very difficult thing to, to think about, but it's what the mathematics suggests. And then when the probability waves peak up together, they say there's a high probability you'll get a particle there, and when they, of course, cancel out, they say there's a low probability. Uh, and therefore, what should happen, according to the theory, is you've got speckles appearing on the pattern, lots of speckles where the bright band was, and not very many speckles where the dark was. And in fact, that's what you see. If you look at the screen, you'll see that's what happens. Now, that in itself is not that remarkable until you start asking, how does it come about that each individual photon, as it were, knows what to do? Um, and the only way you can explain this is that by saying, in some sense, the photon itself splits, whereas classically the light beam split. You now have to somehow get hold of this idea that the photon is somehow aware of both paths. This is a very, very strange uh, concept. In quantum theory, one abandons the possibility of predicting the exact result of any given experiment. What one does is one predicts with extremely good accuracy the probability of a certain outcome. Every student who has ever studied quantum theory has really been shocked by some of the implications by it. It's something that's very difficult to accept. The idea that we, there is a fundamental uncertainty that we cannot predict the outcome of an experiment to 100% accuracy. We can only predict probabilities is very different than our experience in everyday life. Niels Bohr is, uh, is said to have once said that anybody who wasn't absolutely shocked by the statements of quantum physics simply hasn't understood the theory. And I think that's completely correct. Uh, it's a great pity, in a way, that uh, ordinary basic quantum ideas aren't better known, because they do produce these profound paradoxes about the nature of reality. Uh, it comes back to the same point, really. You cannot interpret quantum mechanical statements using ordinary common sense language and ideas. And yet, it's, it lies at the heart of the structure of matter. I mean, the reason, for example, why the whole universe isn't just a great amorphous mass, a solid single ball of gunge, as it were, is precisely because of quantum mechanics. So the stability of matter, the existence of ourselves, depends totally on quantum mechanical effects, and yet they have this paradoxical nature brought into their heart. One of the most fundamental paradoxes in quantum theory springs from the way atoms, the very building blocks of matter, are constructed. This is an atom of iron. Quantum theory suggests that the particles that make up this atom live in a curious maybe world. They may be here, they may be there. There's a fundamental uncertainty about them which seems to defy normal notions of reality. It's an idea that has come to be known as the uncertainty principle. One of the authors of quantum theory, Erwin Schrödinger, wondered what would happen if you used an uncertain subatomic quantum event like radioactive decay to determine the outcome of a large-scale everyday experiment. 
In his mind's eye, the good doctor imagined how the experiment might work. First, he'd need a box into which he could place a suitable object. Next, he'd need some quick-acting poison. substance which would give off particles as it decayed in an entirely random manner according to quantum theory. If the radioactive source were then placed inside a screen detector linked to the poison flask which in turn would be linked to a cat-sized box then the experiment would be ready to proceed. The question Dr. Schrodinger pondered was, what was happening to the cat during the experiment? Was it alive or was it dead? What would he find when he opened the box? What had happened inside the box while he'd been waiting for the experiment to run its course? And once the experiment had been conducted, would the random effects of quantum mechanics have caused the release of a fatal dose of poison gas into the box containing the cat? Was the cat alive or was it dead? Would Schrodinger's curiosity kill the cat? central to the whole standard interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, when you open the box, according to conventional quantum theory, what will happen is you will either see the cat dead or alive. And at that precise instant, in some way which has never really been explained, the state of the cat changes. It really becomes dead or really becomes alive. So before you open the box, before you make the measurement, all you can say is that the cat is potentially dead or alive, but you can't say which. And in fact, it would be wrong to say it is either dead or alive. That is actually incorrect. It really is in some sort of strange uh, twilight state between these two. You open the box, you make the measurement, the cat, as it were, flops into a state of deadness or a state of aliveness. Now, of course, Schrodinger never actually carried out this experiment in real life. But its value as an imaginary experiment is that it highlights what appears to be a key paradox in quantum mechanics. It's complete nonsense for a cat to be described as being both dead and alive at the same time. And there have been various attempts to find alternative interpretations of the quantum theory over the years. And in one such interpretation, the many worlds interpretation, there are parallel universes. In one of these universes, the cat is alive, and in another universe, it's dead. And it's only when we open the box that we discover which of these two universes we are living in. The many worlds idea of parallel universes has been very attractive to many people perplexed by quantum theory. The notion is that there are an infinite number of universes which are unfolding in parallel with ours. Some are subtly different, while others are radically different. And every time we make a decision or a choice in our universe, we determine which of these parallel universes we are about to enter. But can this sort of make it up as you go along theory really be true? A theory in which light can be waves or particles, or both at the same time, a theory of uncertainty and probability, a theory in which the particles which make up atoms aren't really there, a theory which seems to imply an infinity of parallel universes in conflict with ours. Can it really be a sensible description of nature, the nature we see? Can quantum mechanics possibly be true? Quantum mechanics is by no means something that's very esoteric and has no effect on our everyday experience. Perhaps 25% of the gross national product of every country depends upon the laws of quantum mechanics. Transistors, lasers, all modern electronics works upon the laws of quantum mechanics. Well, your television camera is the classic example of it working, of course. It's, it's stacked full of solid-state electronics, and that works entirely on, on quantum mechanics. Every time anybody turns on a television these days or a radio set, they're seeing quantum mechanics at work. Modern computers are entirely based on quantum mechanical devices. 
And in fact, in that sense, in the real sort of practical electronics, uh, quantum mechanics has been verified millions of times, or thousands of millions of times. Uh, so at that level, quantum mechanics is fine. It tells you what happens on the average, what the probability is of certain things happening. And if you just accept it at that level, there's no difficulty. The problems only arise when you start asking what does it mean about reality itself? What picture does it give us of reality? The pictures of quantum reality are taken here at the European Particle Physics Laboratory in Geneva, known in the trade as CERN. This is where they probe into the heart of matter. This is where they smash atoms in order to discover how they're made. As the bits of these collisions fly apart, they leave tracks which the particle physicists can analyze and interpret, giving them clues about how the universe began. I'm a cosmologist. I want to study the universe on very large scales to understand how the universe got the way it is we're observing it today, um, how the galaxies and clusters of galaxies that we see got that way, where they came from. And in order to understand where they came from, you need to understand the physics of the very early universe. And in the very early universe, we're dealing with very high densities, very high temperatures. And um, at those energies and uh, temperatures, the theories that we need involve high energy particle physics. The idea of the accelerator is essentially, it's like a big, incredibly powerful microscope. And it's looking into the constituents of the particles inside the nucleus of the atom. Well, high energy particle physics today is sort of the natural continuation of the historical idea that we should look inside of objects to see what they're made of, so that um, we build microscopes to peer inside of objects, and then we um, discover that they're made of atoms, and then we discover the atom is made of a nucleus with electrons going around, and then we can discover what the nucleus is made of by, for example, smashing things into the nucleus and breaking it up. Now, the nucleus is made of particles, like the protons and neutrons, and these particles are the objects which are used, if you like, in um, accelerators like the ones at CERN, um, and these particles are smashed into each other to see what they are made of. It's a sort of terrestrial astrophysics. The processes that occurred in suns billions of years ago are being recreated here on Earth. The energies involved are inconceivable, the forces unimaginable. It's a quest which reaches back in time to moments which were unbelievably ferocious, a quest which worries at the very moment of creation, a quest which unites cosmologists and physicists in their search for the ultimate answer. A particle accelerator is, in a very real sense, a time machine recreates the conditions that were present in the very early universe. It never ceases to amaze me that you can apply these esoteric ideas, these ideas that at first may not make sense, they seem complicated, but yet they work. Quantum mechanics works, general relativity works. It never ceases to amaze me that we can use the laws of physics to actually predict the origin of the universe and the evolution of the universe. In much the same way that particle accelerators are time microscopes, observatories are time telescopes. Gazing out at the heavens, the views they capture are history, ancient history. Some of the light that reaches us today was first released before our solar system was born. Some of the light we see began its journey back at the beginning of time, but then so did we. Look deep into an astronomer's eye and you will find blood vessels. And in those blood vessels you will find blood cells. And in those blood cells you will find molecules of hemoglobin. Inside those molecules you'll find one of the most extraordinary atoms in the universe, an atom of iron. This atom has had a remarkable life and we're going to tell its story. It's a story that will take us back to the beginning of the universe, to the moment of creation. Before it became bound up in an astronomer's bloodstream, 
This iron atom was quietly minding its own business as part of a continental shelf. This was a geologic formation that erupted from the volcanic maelstrom that was the early Earth. Prior to that, it had been the gravitational field of the newborn Earth, which had drawn our atom towards the planet as it drifted through interstellar space. But this was an atom which had been places, seen things. Ours was not the first sun system it had visited. Before being drawn to the solar disk that had created the Earth, it had been drifting through space. If we track our iron atom back through time, we'll get a glimpse of how it and the universe were created. Unwanted, unhurried, this was an atom which didn't care. But as we go back in time, we begin to see that here's an atom which has experienced stardom in a big way. Here's an atom which was created inside one of the biggest bangs there is. Supernova. When the universe was only five billion years old, our atom burst from an exploding supernova. And as we track it back in time, we can see how it came into being. Deep within the star, collision after collision welded the nucleus of the iron atom together. And now, as we roll back the clock, we can see the components which created it. Further inside the star, it's clear that our complex iron atom was actually built from a host of simpler atomic constituents. And rolling the clock back even further, we can see that everything is made from the simplest possible elements, hydrogen and helium. The universe 
is now less than a hundredth of a second old. It's getting very dense and the electrons are behaving rather oddly. They're beginning to smash into the neutrons and protons. And when they do, something rather curious seems to be happening. The protons are becoming neutrons, and neutrons seem to be able to become protons. As we travel back past one thousandth of a second, the temperature hits a trillion degrees. Yet further back in time, when the universe was just a millionth of a second old, we can begin to see that even our fundamental protons and neutrons are made from smaller bits, bits called quarks. And it's the nature of the quarks which accounts for the strange behavior of the neutrons and protons. As our journey back in time takes us past the moment when the universe was merely a billionth of a second old, all we can see is a rapidly contracting cauldron of quarks. Finally, we arrive at a universe so compressed that it would all fit within the orbit of the Earth and would have been a sweat-making thousand trillion degrees. By a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, everything there is in the universe would have melted back into a soup of quarks and electrons. And yet there's a problem with this picture of the origin of the universe. It doesn't account for gravity. Every time the physicists try to build this most fundamental force into their equations, what do they get? Infinity. We don't know whether these infinities that arise in physics are a fundamental flaw in physics or if that's just the way nature works. Some physicists feel that any theory that has infinity in it has to be sick and is not a complete theory. Usually in physics, when you're doing mathematical calculations, the sorts of infinities that we're talking about occur as singularities. And a singularity in mathematics is when you take an expression and you end up dividing that expression by zero. And you know that if you divide a number, like one or two, by zero, the answer is not well defined. You can't you try it on your calculator, you'll get a, an error. Now, to a physicist, a singularity is about the worst thing that can happen. When a physicist finds a singularity in a calculation, they pull out their hair and scream and jump up and down and kick the dog. Some people are very upset that the laws of physics, as we understand them, predict a singularity at the instant of the Big Bang. Modern physics is based upon the twin pillars of the theory of relativity, on the one hand, that's a theory of space and time, and quantum physics, on the other hand, that's a theory of matter. And much of what we have around us in the sense of technology or uh, advanced experiment stems from one or other of these theories, or the two theories together. Now, the difficulty is this, that mathematically, when you try to marry these two theories and have a unified uh, theory of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, then you run into difficulties. And it's particularly acute if you go to the so-called general theory of relativity, which is a theory of gravitation. You try to put gravitation together with quantum physics, and the two just don't want to go together. What you get is essentially nonsense. You get these infinities popping up all over the place, destroying the predictive power of the theory. So what do you conclude from that? Well, I guess you have to conclude that either one or the other or both are wrong. Which is where superstrings come in. If they exist at all, every quark, every electron, and even the forces between them will be made from tiny vibrating strings which can join up and reform into all the particles known to physics. And the way they vibrate will determine what they are. Physicists are optimistic about superstrings because they appear to obey the laws of quantum theory while at the same time conforming to the principles of general relativity too. And at last, here's a theory which not only explains gravity, it actually predicts it. But it's even more curious than that. Space and time will be made of string too. And the only problem is, it will never be possible to see them. They're just too small. Well, according to superstring theory, the fundamental particles are 
literally string-like extended objects, but of an incredibly small size. Just to get an idea of how, how small I mean, they are as small compared to the size of the nucleus of an atom as the nucleus is compared to the size of the sun, for example. So that we're talking about physics at incredibly short distances. And we're also talking about objects which appear to exist in no less than ten dimensions. The four of space and time, which we're familiar with, and six more, which only intrude into our world at subatomic levels. Now, we can't show ten dimensions on television, so instead imagine a two-dimensional world where only edges can be seen. Into that two-dimensional world comes an object that exists in three dimensions. At first, it's impossible to tell what these alien shapes represent. Are they connected? Is there a pattern here? The inhabitants of the two-dimensional world might never know what it is that's invading their lives. And yet, to those of us familiar with a third dimension, it's readily apparent what the object is, once we're permitted to see that extra dimension. And so it is with superstrings. What physics sees as separate particles are simply different manifestations of objects poking through into our universe from their own multidimensional space. But can something as simple as vibrating string seriously provide us with a theory of everything? What I think uh, is new about the present ideas is that uh, they're more than just hand-waving, they're more uh, than just a good idea. They are a detailed technical theory. Uh, if we take something like superstrings as the best example of something we have, uh, this is not just an attempt to write a, a, a catalogue or a shopping list of, of entities, you've got atoms of this type, particles of that type, you've got space and you've got uh, time, uh, you've got various fields and so on, let's sort of collect them all together and say that's the, the theory of everything. It is something which interweaves all of these entities. It's something which combines space, time, the forces of nature, the particles of nature, the whole caboodle together in a single, all-embracing, one hopes self-consistent uh, mathematical scheme. That's what's new. It is a theory of totally everything not just a sort of rag bag of things put together and saying, uh, you know, that's all that there is. If strings are the correct description of nature, then any attempt to understand the origin of the universe without taking into account the string, stringiness of nature is doomed to failure. If strings are the correct theory, it would change how we view the origin of the universe and necessarily the subsequent evolution of the universe. We as physicists have a rather limited viewpoint on the universe, and we would like to explain certain specific facts in an elegant and economical way. And our hope is that we can explain all of those facts, the forces that we know of and the particles we know of, in terms of a single underlying principle. That principle is what we would then call a theory of everything. But of course, it, it almost certainly will not be everything. The history of science is full of lessons which indicate that just when physicists think they have a theory that explains everything, they discover there's an absolute crisis in the subject, and there are many phenomena that they hadn't noticed before which need explanation. But it may even be that there is an absolute limit to what science can know. A moment so far back in time that even superstring theory may not be able to describe what was going on. At the time, the entire universe would have been smaller even than a superstring, and at such dimensions, physics encounters a barrier so impassable that we cannot know what happens beyond it. The fact that we can see as far as we do is a tribute to these giants of physics whose insight has given us such hindsight. But nevertheless, our journey back in time stops here. The traditional laws of physics break down at this point, and we need some new idea. Now, superstring theory seems to provide us with the hope of getting a glimpse of what is happening beyond the barrier. But it seems doubtful, at least to me, that it will actually provide an explanation for the creation of the universe itself. For the moment, we may as well believe any of the beautiful ancient creation myths. Uh, who knows, maybe the universe was created by a couple of Japanese gods stirring up the sea of chaos. I suppose the origin of the universe is the place where you might most expect to encounter God, so to speak. Uh, because until recently, it was not possible to account for how the universe came into being without having some sort of supernatural input. Uh, so I think there's been a lot of attention given to this uh, sort of creation event, as it's sometimes called. 
But one of the remarkable things that's come out of very recent work in quantum gravity and uh, applying quantum theory to the universe as a whole is that you actually don't need to have a, a supernatural button-pushing uh, creator back at the beginning to set the whole show going. It's possible to have the universe, uh, so to speak, pop into existence on its own, entirely spontaneously, entirely uncaused, and entirely in accordance with the laws of physics. But even if superstring theory does turn out to be a description of all of space and all of time and all of the matter in it, it's still hard to imagine that the majestic complexity of the universe we see around us may be no more than a quantum hiccup. It all seems to have been so exquisitely well designed, and yet the uncertainty principle clearly indicates that it could all be a huge unplanned accident a freak event that had no cause and fulfills no purpose. Just one of an infinity of universes popping into existence simply because it can. It's an idea which strikes at the foundations of mankind's self-esteem and, of course, his religious beliefs. This is a description of creation which doesn't need a creator. There are those, however, who suggest that someone or something had to devise the rules of nature, the laws of physics, and that God, whatever God is, is a mathematician. Next week, Equinox looks at the fighter aircraft of the future. That's next Sunday at 7 o'clock. There's a booklet to accompany this programme. For a copy, send a cheque or postal order for £3, payable to Channel 4, to Equinox Universe, PO Box 4000, London W3 6XJ. Mm -hmm.